In the first lecture, I argued that the doctrine of the Trinity reveals the terminal value of persons and that because we're created in the image of God, there is no value in the cosmos higher than our own personality because even the value that we have is bequeathed to us by God in the image of God. And so personhood is the ultimate value that there is. Consequently, anything which works against the value of personhood is illicit, is non-Christian, and ought not to be done. Also, we're made for the communion of persons. Because God exists in a trinity, persons never are fulfilled on their own, but persons are always meant to engage in relation with others, and marriage is, in fact, the primordial communio personarum, which we're for. In the second lecture, I articulated the Christian tradition's understanding of the various goods of marriage, namely friendship, or the unitive good, children, or the procreative good, and the, and the sacrament, right? Articulating how marriage establishes genuine and abiding friendship, how marriage is a means to transform us into friendship with God, and then how beneficial marriage and children are for society and decency and so on, using some evidence from the social sciences to that point. Today it's on the ethics of marriage. Today we're going to talk about contraception, pre- and non-marital sex, pornography, and homosexuality. I'm probably not going to solve any of these questions for you, but hopefully give you a bit more for conversation uh, and some, perhaps some intellectual resources and terms for your own debates and arguments back in the dorm rooms, which is where most education occurs. <laughs> hopefully not education about these things <laughs> directly, but in conversation or thought. You never know with, you know, you're all, I don't know what to make of you sometimes. <laughs> Most of the talk occurs at the beginning. I'm not going to fight about the details of application because most of the application is resolved if we think carefully of the first principles. So the paper will be front loaded, right? Lots of principle and you'll find that I have maybe two paragraphs on most of the concrete issues because if you get the principles, the issues are solved. Okay? Principle one, our bodies ourselves. Maybe you're familiar with that book, our bodies ourselves. Now here's the thing to remember. The Christian story is good news. It's not bad news or even mediocre news. And it's certainly not rooted, news rooted in shame or repugnance or spitefulness or disgust or bigotry or hatred. The Christian story is always rooted in love, but not love in a vacuous way, which is merely indicative of our own cultural times or of sentiment. The gospel of Christ is not the gospel of nice. Love is not niceness. Love is not vacuous. Love is that which wills the good of the other. And willing the good of the other is quite a robust thing and sometimes is very hard to do. And consequently, the love, which is the Christian story, is intelligent, it's reasonable, it's normed, and it's under the good guidance and instruction of God. Okay? There's a great line from an Anglican prayer which states that God hates nothing he has made. And while the very rigorous Christian sexual ethic is sometimes quite hard to follow, as you well know, it is our ethics because of our belief that the world is good that the world is drenched in order, and that everything stems from a perfectly good and perfectly loving God whose very nature is to exist in interpenetrating community, is three-in-oneness. Consequently, the Christian sexual ethic has as its main principle the terminal worth of persons and the terminal worth of the relation of persons together. We believe that persons are worth delighting in. You know, remember that great line from C.S. Lewis where he suggests that if we actually saw each other as we were, we'd be tempted to worship each other as little gods? That's not far from the Christian truth. If we saw each other for what we were, we would be tempted to worship each other as little gods. Consequently, we should see a perfect and proper order in the Genesis story and Adam's sheer delight in Eve. Remember this from the first talk, right? His happy cry of, at last, at last. Someone like himself, a person with whom he can enter into covenant and thus be fully human and in relationship to her be more fully in relation to God. Remember my claim that only when he said yes to Eve did he say yes to God? So we shouldn't be surprised that this happy acceptance of each other is a sexed acceptance of each other. Adam does not just accept another person, but the man delights and accepts a woman and the woman accepts the man with the story culminating in their marriage. Quote, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, I love that little detail in the story. All too frequently, Christian is thought of in overly ethereal and spiritualized language. 
But marriage is not some strange affair of spirituality. It's a sacrament, and sacraments always involve matter. In fact, salvation is always and only offered to us via matter, the body of Christ himself, and not in some vague, ethereal, mystical, spiritual world. Christianity is a religion of the flesh, not a religion of the heart or the spirit. Christ becomes flesh. He's born of women, of, of a woman. He does not, in the words of the old hymn, forsake the virgin's womb. He drinks, he eats, he grows, he sweats, he bleeds, he laughs. And because God redeems what he has created in the way that he has created it, he resurrects from the dead. And the way that God offers us his own life and his own friendship is through ordinary physical bodily things, primarily through water, bread, wine, friendship, and through the body of another. That Adam and Eve know each other sexually is not an accident. It's not merely a natural necessity. Right, just that, well, they need, there needs to be babies, and so God sort of allows there to be sex. It's not just a tack on to the story. It's the heart of the story. It's the point of the story. They become husband and wife, one flesh, not in some mystical way, but in their physical, conjugal union. And this is good. As an aside, I think it's no accident that non-sacramental churches struggle so mightily to articulate the goodness of marriage. Now, because this is a good thing, it is not only perfectly natural, but perfectly Christian to want to unite physically with the body of another. This is not merely a biological impulse, but is in fact a normed element of God's good creation. Nor is it somehow unseemly or impure to want, sometimes to want desperately, to be with the one that you love. Nor is it unusual that as you grow in affection and love for another, you would wish to unite with them more and more, from hand-holding at the roller rink to the kiss behind the roller rink to the marital act itself, hopefully not at the roller rink. <laughs> now, this is... <laughs> that wasn't in the text, see? This is why Amy should be here. Wave around and say, don't say that. Now, this is as it should be, and it's good. And pretending otherwise, right, pretending that there's not a want and that want is not sometimes pretty desperate, doesn't make you pure or spiritual. It makes you ungrateful and unchristian. Here's the little phrase I use to explain this, and I intend to tell my kids when they're old enough to date, although they're seven and five, so it's easy for me to say that now. You're going to ask me in ten years. But here's the phrase. You should be trying to get the other person into bed, but in a decent, ordered, loving way. <laughs> If you're not trying to get them into bed, there's no reason to be talking to them or dating them. Your friends not dating, right? And you're not somehow more pure or spiritual if you're dating someone that you wouldn't hope to get into bed. You're just now friends, not dating, right? This desire to get the other person into bed honorably is a sign of the image of God. For as God exists in a communion of persons, so are we meant for communion. Now. There's a huge assumption that I've made throughout. And the assumption is that our bodies are in fact ourselves. I am my body, you are your body. My, all my claims in the previous paragraphs assume that in wanting physical union, right, that biological impulse which you know well, one in fact wants personal union. Think of the text, and Adam knew Eve. It doesn't say an Adam knew Eve's body, or Adam had sex with Eve, it says that Adam knew Eve. He knows her. He is joined to her, to her very person. If the marital act were merely about the union of bodies, it would not be about our persons, but it is if our bodies and our persons were distinct. Do you remember the long and horrible wedding night scene that I read to you last time? You remember that scene? Right, the scene which ends with the, with the husband in isolation and the, and the new bride retching in the toilet alone? Do you remember that? It's a horrible scene, wasn't it? Now, you remember the question that I asked you last time? I asked you to imagine what it would be like to be rejected as a person in such a scene, but I didn't ask you what it would be like to be rejected as a body in such a scene, right? Because as she retches into the toilet, does he feel a rejection merely of his body or does he feel a rejection of his very personhood? As would you. Right? So my claim throughout is that persons have terminal value, that there's nothing more valuable than all the cosmos than persons, and that our bodies are personal, 
and so that we ought to reject any form of dualism or use which treats the body as subpersonal. In other words, if persons have terminal value and I am my body, my body has terminal value. Okay? And I think that's, a, that's the Christian story. Thus, he does not forsake the virgin's womb and he resurrects from the dead. Now, not everyone thinks this. Not everyone thinks that they are their bodies. I was recently reading an interview with a rising voice in sexual ethics in which she says something like the following. The worth of a woman is what she does ethically. This is her. The worth of a woman is what she does ethically, her compassion, her heart, not what she does with her body. Now I think of that as being deeply wrong. Consider the language, what she does with her body. That's the anthropology of Plato, isn't it? Where we are our souls or spirits or hearts, and we happen to have bodies, but in some fundamental way we are not our bodies. In that anthropology, our bodies are like our clothes, or our handbags, or our belts, or our shoes. We have them, we can use them, but they aren't us. The Christian story denies this rather explicitly. God creates Adam from the dirt and breathes life into the dirt, but nothing in the human scripture indicates the existence of some separate entity, the soul or spirit, which is distinct from the body as a separate, let alone primary, reality. Nothing in the Christian story suggests that you're primarily your soul or spirit and have a body. Okay? This is why salvation must be obtained by the birth, life, death, and bodily resurrection of Christ and bestowed to us in water and food and drink. God does not do some magical spiritual trick to save us in heaven because there is no magical spiritual trick which could save us, for we're bodies, and so bodies save bodies. This is why the promise of the Christian faith is not the immortality of the soul and not going to heaven forever. The promise of the Christian faith is the resurrection of the body and God's descent to earth to reside with us on earth in our physical form forever. Death is the great enemy in the Christian tradition. And if we were just souls, death would not be the great enemy. It would be entirely a matter of indifference to us, wouldn't it? Have you been to Christian funerals where they acted as if they were Platonists rather than Christians and they talked about the immortality of the soul flying up to be with God in heaven? Why did, God, why did Christ need to resurrect if that has already happened? That makes the Christian story at odds with itself. You're a body, you will be a body forever. Now, I'd argue that good philosophy and biology teach the same thing. Isn't it amazing how the faith properly understood keeps turning out to be true? The reason science can't find the soul is, because, is not because science is atheistic, but because we're bodies. And if we were bodies and souls, here's another question, are we two beings? How odd, how many, of there, how many of me are there in front of you? Two? No, there's just me, the one you see. It's just that the one you see is a person. It's an incarnate person. I think our best moral intuitions confirm this as well. <clears throat> Consider the following scene from Eliot's Wasteland. As I read the scene, you're gonna feel bad for the woman because of the way her body is treated. But if she was a separate entity distinct from her body, there'd be very little reason to feel bad for the way her body was treated. Right? If I'm not my body, it doesn't much matter what happens to my body because that doesn't happen to me. So here's the scene from The Wasteland. It's one of my favorite scenes in poetry. The typist home at tea time clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations, touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. Right, so here we have a young woman preparing dinner from tins, right? So she's eating potted meat, and her underthings are lying about the house drying. This is not, a, this is not a, a, an image of wealth, right? This is an image of some squalor. He, the young man carbuncular, he's got lots of acne, arrives. A small house's agent's clerk with one bold stare. One of the low on whom assurance sits is a silk hat and a Bradford millionaire. Do you know any of these, you know any of these people? One of the low who is overly assured of themselves even though there's no reason for them to be assured, right? Because they're just a small clerk. The time is now propitious as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired. Endeavors to engage her in caresses which are still unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense, and his vanity requires no response, and makes a welcome of indifference. Right, so she's indifferent to him, and he in his vanity assumes that means she wants him, right, because she doesn't actually repel repulse him. <clears throat> 
bestows, and then there's a sort of ellipsis, the scene goes on, he bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit, right? So he's leaving now. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again, alone, she smooths her hair with an automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. The body is personal, right? Her body has been used, which means her person has been used. It's why we find the scene distressing, right? She's been used by the young men carbuncular, right? Who in his boldness encounters no resistance and so assumes that she's in, aroused and interested, right? And he bestow, after the act is done, he bestows a patronizing kiss. She is left alone in her squalor, right? And says, well, that's done and I'm glad it's over. We find that distressing because something has happened to her and not merely to her body. The body is personal, all of it. And so the body has terminal value. Now the basic rule of mor the basic moral rule of personhood is that persons, whether in one's own self or another, ought never be treated as mere tools, but always as goods, as terminal goods of incredible value. That was the point of the whole first talk, right? Persons have terminal values, so you oughtn't use them as tools because they're in pardon me, I'm losing my voice, sorry, because they're ends in themselves. Now let me suggest two following provisional maxims for now, both of which will be relevant later. Here's the first. If persons ought not be treated as instruments, and if bodies are an intrinsic element of our persons, then the body ought not to be treated as an instrument, even as an instrument of pleasure, even if that pleasure is voluntary. That is to say, there are no good reasons to dehumanize our bodies. And that we sometimes want to dehumanize our bodies is not a good enough reason to do it, nor is pleasure. Second, we ought not disintegrate ourselves by choosing goods like pleasure or physical release, which go against the good of the whole of our person. I am a unity, so are you. We are a complex whole, and it is not ever justified to seek one aspect of our good if that seeking violates the reasonable order of another aspect of the complex whole. Now, of course, at times one seeks one good rather than another, or one good more than another, right? So just being here learning, you're not out exercising, right? So you're seeking one good more than another, right? You're seeking the good of knowledge, maybe more than the good of health. But my claim is not that you have to seek all good simultaneously, because that would be absurd, but the claim is that one ought never seek one good at the expense or violation of the order of another good. If persons are of value, it's simply not okay to violate one aspect of our personhood for the benefit of another aspect. For that treats persons as a whole, not as values, but merely in part of themselves as instruments to be used, which violates the notion of personhood. So don't treat people like tools, and don't seek one good in a way which breaks the integrity of the whole. Those two maxims, I think, determine all the rest of the concrete debates. Principle two. Sex is for marriage. So principle one was our bodies ourselves on my body. Principle two, sex is for marriage. God presents Eve to Adam. Oh, by the way, after the last conversation, one of you sent me an email saying, doesn't your whole read depend upon a literal reading of scripture? It doesn't. It just assumes that scripture teaches theological truth in whatever mode or genre scripture uses. So if there was not a historical Adam and Eve, nothing of my argument would change because God has seen fit to teach us with the story of Adam and Eve. If there was a historical Adam and Eve, my argument's the same. Okay, so no, it doesn't depend upon a literal reading. God presents Eve to Adam, and Adam with great delight recognizes her. He knows her as like himself, equal in humanity and dignity, and he knows her as another. She is not just him or a reduplication, but she is distinct in her own solitude as a person and distinct from him in her body, which is to say, in her personhood. Scripture does and scripture does not seem to be teaching that Adam's loneliness was not a good simply because he didn't have a friend, but because she, as a sexed being distinct from him, was not there. Right? It's not that he was alone because there wasn't another person. It's that it is not good because there was not a woman. The story tells us that the two will become one flesh. And this recognition involves his knowing her. And this knowing is sexual. It's not some disembodied Gnostic thing. And his knowing, the text tells us, entails her conceiving. Okay, so here's the question. Marriage has many goods, apparently. We've been talking about that last time. But they are not reducible to each other, and each of them exists in some integrity of their own. Yet, can there be marriage if one, if one doesn't seek all of the goods? 
They might not reduce to each other, but can the marriage exist without the goods? In particular, here's what I mean, can there be marriage without seeking the procreative good? And the answer, I'll argue, as does the Christian tradition, is no. There is no genuine marriage which does not seek the procreative good. Now, certainly marriage exists as the cause of the social goods and not vice versa. Marriage is not good because it's socially beneficial. It's socially beneficial because it's good. But it's not clear that marriage can exist at all without seeking the unitive and procreative goods. Unity is friendship, procreation is children. Or even that the unitive goods absent from the procreative goods are a sufficient reason for marriage. In other words, if you seek the unitive good of marriage, friendship, without seeking the procreative good, you're not seeking marriage, you're seeking friendship. One is married when there's sex. That's what makes marriage. Marriage as opposed to just a particularly long friendship. It's sex. It's the procreative element which determines it as a unique and irreducibly distinct relationship. And that's what the law and custom and the church has taught since its beginning. Both canon and common law recognizes the importance of consummation to a marriage. For until sexual intercourse occurs in marriage, the marriage is no marriage. The marriage is not yet actualized. The way I like to put it, just to offend Martha Mackey, is marriage is made in bed, not in church. She always gets mad every time I say that. Are any of you watching Downton Abbey right now? It's so good. Best TV show uh, television ever, I think. So I don't want to spoil it for you, but Captain Crawley is wounded, okay? Captain Crawley has come back from the war, and his spinal cord has been transected. If you are not caught up for this yet, you may just want to cover your ears if you're following this story, because it's so good. And it turns out that he, he'll now be impotent, right? Because he'll be unable to, to, to engage in sexual activity because of the transection of his spine. And he has a fiance that he wishes to let down, right? That he wishes to let her go, rather. Right, so that she's not trapped into a marriage which is described uh, in this show as a childless, childless nunnery. And he tells her the following words, we cannot be properly married. And she says, well, yes, we can. And he looks at her and says, we cannot be properly married. And she says, oh, okay. What he means is because we cannot be lovers, we cannot be married. And that is what the church has taught. There is no marriage until it's consummated. Marriage is made in bed, not in the church. The church ceremony occurs so that one can go to bed in a decent and honorable way, blessed by God. Covenants always require enactment, and the enactment of the marriage covenant is consummation. Now further, the tradition doesn't declare that just any old sex act actualizes the marriage. Okay? It doesn't say, oh yeah, you've done something now, you're married. The tradition teaches that rather that only those acts which constitute spousal acts, defined as sex acts of the reproductive type, which if you want that to be defined, is genital to genital intercourse of man or woman consummates the marriage. You're married only when there's genital to genital intercourse. The tradition thus thinks that the procreative type acts are essential to marriage and there cannot be marriage without the enactment of procreative type sex acts. And that's because marriage is not just friendship. It's an intense friendship which involves sex acts of the reproductive kind. And moreover, this standard is the only standard which makes marriage meaningful as a category. What I mean by that is, unless you define marriage as related to sex acts of the reproductive kind, there, are, there is no other standard which makes marriage delineated from any other option. Right? So there's no reason to delimiate polyamory or group marriage or single marriage or a filial object marriage where people get married to physical objects like the Eiffel Tower, or the Berlin Wall, or their computer. Those things actually exist. That's, that's not, a, I'm not using an exaggeration. That's true. The only way that you can delineate the nature of marriage is as the tradition has defined it, which is in a friendship over time committed to each other in all ways, including sex acts of the reproductive type. Now that's all based on the authority of common in, in civil law, and that authority might need some more. So let's try to work it out in detail. Here's what marriage is. Marriage is a two-in-one flesh unity of a man and woman, and that's what scripture, tradition, and the natural law, as well as the civic law, have taught. It's a two-in-one flesh unity. In order for there to be a two-in-one flesh unity, there must be, strictly and literally, a union of flesh, sex. 
They cleave together, Scripture says, to form one flesh, and thus they know each other, and as the text says, the possibility of reproduction occurs. So not just friendship or affection, and not just any old kind of sex act, but genital to genital unity is what defines marriage. Incidentally, this is why it's not random or arbitrary for the church to limit marriage and to claim that some cannot be marriage, married. It's not because the church is bigoted, it's because other forms of marriage are impossible. They cannot happen because they're not marriage. Lots to talk about there. We'll, we'll go back if you want. I'm sure you have questions or maybe objections. Issue one, contraception. Contraception is so normalized in our society that its use for, is presumed for married and unmarried alike. In fact, so normalized is contraception that its use is thought not only normalized, but even obligatory. You must use contraception if you were to be responsible in our society. Given the realities of STDs, unwanted pregnancies, abortions, one in five pregnancies in the world ends in abortion, so contraception isn't solving that apparently. Financial ability, overpopulation, and then of course just the freedom of mobility if you're young. So normalized in fact that contraception is thought of as something like shampoo or deodorant, an obvious necessity that you don't think about before you pick up. Right? So you know when you run out of toothpaste, the only thing you think is, oh, there's an inconvenience, I'm out of toothpaste, can I borrow yours and then I gotta go to the store. Right? Contraception is sort of like that in our society. It's not a moral issue. Nobody thinks about it as a moral issue. It's like buying shampoo. So normalized is it that you don't actually choose to use contraception because you never actually decide that it's something you should do, you just do it. Right? Like you didn't actually choose to use toothpaste, you just do it because that's what people do. Right? Or if you chose to use toothpaste, your family is unlike many others. <laughs> at, least, at least here, or at least here and now, not universally. Now, I find this situation rather odd, the situation that contraception is obligatory and normalized, especially for Christians. I suspect that a good many of us have never heard a sermon or a lesson or a teaching on contraception. You sort of vaguely know that's a Catholic thing and none of the Catholics follow it anyway. But that's not true. <laughs> Contraception was universally condemned and forbidden by the church, every denomination, and every church body until quite recently. There was not a single Christian church which condoned contraception until the Church of England's Lambeth Conference of 1930. Even then, the suspicion of contraception was enormous. It was outlawed for anyone except married couples until quite recently and involved several momentous court decisions. And this is not Catholic. Calvin and Luther for, Luther, for instance, reject contraception in incredibly harsh terms. Also, the arguments that we now give for contraception are not rooted in the traditional authorities of the church. The church has traditionally used scripture, tradition, and reason in that order, and has not used experience as a guide for matters of sexual taste and sexual morality. But this is what the Church of England, which is my own church, now states. Quote, Anglicans have tended to call on scripture, tradition, and reason. Increasingly, these approaches are being supplemented by appeals to human experience. And it's clear that the experience of married couples in relation to contraception has changed. But that's a vacuous moral standard, right? Because if the experience of marriage was that everyone had an open marriage, then the experience of married couples would have changed and open marriages would now be the authoritative norm. You can't appeal to what people do as a moral authority. You have to appeal to what they ought to do as a moral authority, which is why experience is such a shaky ground for theology and probably why you shouldn't read blue like jazz, but should read Augustine. <laughs> Now those little bits of data, the long-standing tradition of the church and the oddity of overruling 2,000 years of church experience, and by the way, longer than that because the Jewish faith custom has also been against contraception. How very odd to overrule thousands of years of religious reflection with a few years of experience. Now, the fact that it's old doesn't mean that it's true. Lots of nonsense is old, right? And it's not, something's not right because it's ancient. But it's odd that in a span of several decades, based on experience, millennia, have been, millennia of moral thought have been overturned with virtually no conversation. So much so that 2,000 years of what was obviously true in the church is something that I suspect the vast majority of you have never heard talked about in church. That's bizarre. That's bizarre. Now, all, my only claim is that means we need to think through contraception seriously. Okay? There's a lovely quote from Wendell Berry on this. 
What is horrifying is not that we are relying so exclusively on a technology of birth control that is still experimental, but that we are using it casually, in utter cultural nakedness, unceremoniously, without sufficient understanding and as a substitute for cultural solutions. And to promote these means without cultural insight is merely a way to divorce sexuality from fertility, pleasure from responsibility. So I just think we need to think through contraception again. I'm going to make both a maximal and a minimal claim. I'm going to report the maximal claim and I'll actually make the minimal claim as my own position. Here's the maximal claim. So by maximal, I mean the really robust, hard-hitting position against contraception. The minimal claim, which is the one I'll articulate as my own today, is a claim which says, yeah, it's serious enough, we need to think about it. And one of the things we need to think about is the maximal claim. Okay, but I won't here defend the maximal. So here's the maximal. The claim made by the opponents to contraception is that contraception renders sex acts of the genital to genital kind, and remember, that's what defines marriage, as non-reproductive. Let's work through this. Now, all spousal acts, in definition, are acts of the reproductive type. Contraceived sex acts are not of the reproductive type, and so contraceived sex acts are not spousal acts. Further, only spousal acts are morally permissible acts, which means only married sex, married sex is allowed, uh, but contraceived sex acts are not married sex, and so contraceived sex acts are morally irresponsible. Now, that's a lot of syllogism compacted, so let me, let me flesh it out. Marriage, by definition, is the making of one flesh union into a single potentially re reproducing organism. Okay? And the marriage is enacted and then renewed by the spousal sex acts. So it's enacted. You get married in bed on the wedding night, all right? And then it's renewed every time the married couple engages in the sex act. Okay? So it's enacted and renewed. Covenant is made. Covenant is promised again. Covenant is promised again and again and again. Now, those spouse act, spousal sex acts are always potentially reproductive. Oral and anal sex is not this type of act. But contraception changes the nature of the genital to genital encounter from reproductive to non-reproductive. And thus, contraceived sex acts are not marital acts at all. According to this argument, then, they violate the nature of one flesh union and make even legally sanctioned marriage not marital sex. They might cause pleasure. They might release tension. They might cause friendship. But they don't cause marriage or enact the covenantal and sacramental goods of marriage. According to this argument, there just simply is no marriage at all without the possibility of reproduction. But note, the claim here is not that reproduction must actually occur. A sterile heterosexual couple, right, without the possibility of reproducing, are married because they engage in sex acts of the reproductive type. But the reproductive type may or may not have children supervene on the act. Now, the opponents of contraception go farther. Not only is contracepted sex not marital and thus illicit, but contracepted sex is, the argument goes, equivalent to mutual masturbation, which treats the body of the other and oneself as an object rather than a person. In other words, contracepted sex is morally equivalent to mutual masturbation because you're merely using your own body and the body of another for pleasure as opposed to the procreative good. Bodies are non-personal. I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Bodies are personal. They're not subpersonal. If we choose to use a human body, our own or that of another, as an instrument which disintegrates the end from its intrinsic good, then we reject the body to functioning as a tool for pleasure. The argument thus is that to contraceive sex is to seek some goods of sex, pleasure or friendship, right, mutual aid, minimizing of sin or whatever, without the full integration of sexuality, without a commitment to the full community of goods, which is, as I claimed earlier in my second maxim, a disintegration. It seeks one good at the, at the expense of violating another, which treats the sum total of the person as a means. Contraceived sex, thus, is masturbation, and masturbation is always wrong. That's the maximal claim. Okay? I'm reporting that one. Here's the minimal claim, which is the one I'll defend today. And I think we should take the maximal claim seriously. Here's my minimal claim. Contraception, practiced as the norm, rejects the other person in their totality. If in the Christian understanding, marriage is a full gift of self and a full receipt of the other, including and especially their body, then to reject the fertility of one's own body or the body of another is to reject some aspect of the other. It's to reject them as they are, because we're sexed, we're bodies. One reason I think that the traditional argument does not unfairly burden women, and th this is real, men don't get pregnant, women do, right? So, Procreation has with it 
I worry of the undue burdens that it places on women. It's why one of the arguments in favor of contraception is that it helps women so much, right? Because it allows them to engage in sexual activity without the really long gestation process, the really long nursing process, the really long process which of raising children, which women rather than men pick up as a statistical norm, right? Even working mothers as a statistical norm provide for children more than, than the fathers do, okay? It's the way it works out. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. That's, I, I have no dog in that fight today. But that's one of the arguments for contraception is that it helps women. The response to that is that's not the case. The traditional argument does not unfairly burden women precisely because it elevates to highest dignity the entirety of the woman's body. What I mean by that is fertility is not subpersonal, right? And so the processes of fertility, cervical muc mucus, menstruation, sloughing of the uterine wall, and et cetera, are in fact not subpersonal, but personal. They're not things which happen to the body, which is not you. They're things which happen to you, and as personal, they have terminal value in and of themselves. Well, I should rephrase. They are part of the complex whole, which has terminal value. And to reject them is to reject some aspect of the complex whole. In other words, the body of the woman is her person, just as the body of the man is, is his person. And the sexual and reproductive elements of persons are not devoid of personal integrity. I don't think it's any accident then that the, the papal encyclical Humana Vitae in the 60s, which warned against contraception, one of its main arguments was the unintended consequence of the degradation of women and the degradation of the body of women. Here's how Wendell Berry puts that. Contempt for the body is invariably manifested in contempt for other bodies, the bodies of slaves, laborers, women, animals, plants, the earth itself. Relationships with all other creatures become competitive and exploitive rather than collaboral and convivial. The world is seen and dealt with not as a community but as a stock exchange, the ethics of which are based on the tragically misnamed law of the jungle. The body is thus sent to war against itself. In this mode of thinking, the other has no intrinsic, I'm sorry, the body has no intrinsic relation to the self and thus must be understood as opposition, as an object of competition, threat, or consumption. And we thus condemn ourselves to a loneliness for which the only compensation is violence against ourselves and against others. I think that now in our society, our conception of sexuality is caught up into a broader ecological and social disruption, which results in Barry's phrase, in the industrial phenomenon in which the body is used as an idea of pleasure, a pleasure machine, with the aim of freeing pleasure from consequence. So isolated from fertility, sex suffers, again Barry, the takeover of specialists, the sexual clinicians, this is still him, and the pornographers, both of whom subsist on the divorce between sex and fertility. That's all that pornography is, isn't it, at the end of the day? A divorce of sex from fertility, a divorce of sex from the comprehensive gift of one to another. This is done in the name of freedom, but by freeing food and sex, Barry, again, from worry, we have also acted to set them apart from thought, responsibility, and this is, Barry, the issue of quality. Sex without fertility is sex without much need for thought. And so it cedes responsibility for sexuality to the specialists. That's why you don't have to choose, right? You have ceded, we have ceded as a, as a culture, the responsibility of our fertility to the clinicians and the specialists. Someone gives us something and we are no longer embodied fertile people. Birth control becomes as carelessly added to the purchase list as any other commodity without concern for the total health of persons and culture. Further, thus reduced, sexuality loses its proper relationship to the household. You can't divorce sexuality from fertility without in the end divorcing sexuality from the household. Because the household comes into being with fertility. It's why men cleave to women and women to men. Because they've had sex and there's the possibility of a baby and babies need to be raised. All right? Children are the primary means that by nature promiscuous non-monogamous mammals stick together because it's hard work to ensure the survival of the young. It's really hard work to ensure the survival of the young. When you divorce fertility from sex, you divorce sex from the household. You divorce it from marriage. As a result, we tend to think of sexuality as having a big sign on our front, welcome or keep out private property. And that's about it. We think that we're for ourselves and by ourselves. John Paul II mentions a hatred or even a fear, a terrified repugnance of fertility. 
He talks, that, he talks about how fertility becomes our enemy in our society, something, against we wa something we wage war against with pesticides. And as in so doing, the body becomes something that we wage war against with pesticides. Sexuality is thus depersonalized as well. And rather than a recognition of gratitude and a recognition that it is a sacramental gift from God, the body becomes rather a mode of self-assertion and personal pleasure. And so the limits and order of sexuality becomes reduced. So here's the claim I'll make about contraception today. It's a big deal. And being thoughtless about it has grave consequences for the health of marriage, for the health of sex, for the health of culture. Maybe there are arguments and grave arguments for the use of contraception. Maybe contraception is licit within marriage, but even then it ought to be engaged in with the utmost care, fully cognizant of its dangers. Issue two, premarital, non-marital sex, and pornography. Now, you see where all this is going, right? I mean, the lecture's done. You can see the implications of these arguments. The lecture is front-loaded with claims about the body and marriage and reproduction because those claims solve all the disputes about application. It would hardly be possible for the Christian tradition to claim, as it does, that sex exists as a means of comprehensive gift and receipt of personhood, and that marriage is a good obtained by this comprehensive gift, and then smile knowingly and with a wink at non-marital sex, pornography, or masturbation. That would clearly be contradictory, wouldn't it? You can't claim that it's a comprehensive gift which establishes marriage and then smile at non-marriage. Now, when sex and marriage are severed, and by marriage I mean that comprehensive one flesh union, which gives the entirety of the self while receiving the entirety of the self of the other, including the reproductive capacity. When sex and marriage are severed, sex cannot but violate the integrity of the person. For any and all sexual activity outside of marriage simply refuses to give or refuses to accept person. And thus, it uses person. There's no way around that, is there? The young man carbuncular uses her. She, it's not clear in the text, uses herself and uses him. There's no way that non-marital sex doesn't violate the integrity of the person because it refuses to give or to receive the entirety and, or integrity of the other. There's a film by Michael Winterbottom, a British director, uh, I really like, called Wonderland. There's this character, Nina, in it, <clears throat> who, uh, she, she's, she's looking for random hookups, okay? And there's this one scene where she's hooked up with some guy, he's a stranger, they sleep together, he falls asleep. She wakes up and she's trying to get herself out of, out of there, right? She's trying to do this sort of walk of shame out of there before he wakes up. And Winterbottom chooses to demonstrate her shame by the awkwardness with which she gets dressed. Right? So you, you know in films how often there's been a couple, they've, they, they've made love, and then she's trying to dress without him seeing her. This is a trope which occurs in film all the time, right? Her trying to dress without him seeing her, even though they've just engaged in the most intimate act imaginable, she doesn't want to be seen. And Winterbottom does it most particularly with the awkwardness with which she tries to get on her stockings. All right? I imagine that getting on nylons in the dark is somewhat an awkward state of affairs anyway. Right? But when you're trying to do it without being seen, it becomes particularly awkward. And her awkwardness and shame as she's sort of struggling to get her nylons on are the sign of being used by him and of using herself. And there was no other option because it was defined from the beginning that this would not be comprehensive. She would have to leave. Right? That's what non-marital sex is. You won't be here tomorrow, right? or you won't be here a year from now, or you won't be here until death does us part, or you won't be here in such a way that I bind myself to you, right? And to use sexually oneself or the other without binding oneself to them and accepting their troth to you as a binding comprehensive gift is to decide to use them. You can't have non-marital premarital sex that doesn't violate the integrity of persons. Now, I myself am pretty opposed to the language of purity that is prevalent in some Christian circles, nor would I kiss dating goodbye, <laughs> as I think that one, <laughs> some of you read the book, yeah, okay. Because I actually think that one role of dating is the tricky business of creating the desire to get the other person to bed in a decent way. That's why one dates, to create desire managed to create desire to get the other person into bed in an honorable way. Again, my kids are five, ask me in 10 years. <laughs> but the language of purity also implies dirt 
filth, gore, and brings with it the unwanted and unhelpful consequences of making too many young people think of their bodies and their desires as bad, disgusting, and trying to rid themselves of that desire, which is an exercise in impossibility. The problem is not the body. The problem is not its desires. These aren't bad. Rather, they're good, in fact. They ought to be cultivated. They ought to be nurtured. They ought to be educated. They ought to be refined, right? But rather, what's bad is our willingness to violate value, to use and besmirch good things by treating them as less than they are. Consequently, the problem with non-marital sex or pornography or solo masturbation is not that it desires, not that it's about sex, not that it's dirty, because it isn't, but that it doesn't desire enough. It doesn't desire the whole person, nor does it desire to give the whole person, and thus it disintegrates people from people. It disintegrates the goods. It seeks pleasure, either physically or emotional, or comfort, or a truncated form of friendship, while knowingly and willingly violating the good of one flesh union. That is, it violates the good of marriage. And sex outside of marriage is a violation of personhood. That just follows from what I've claimed previously. So the answer is desire more. Desire to delight in another as Adam delighted to Eve, and Eve delighted in Adam. And to desire to be delighted in as Eve was de delighted in by Adam, and Adam was delighted in by Eve. That's the Christian answer. Desire more. Cultivate that desire. Build it so that you can enter into knowledge of the other, the gift, which does not reduce yourself or the other to a tool, a machine, a mechanism of use. And all these forms of sexual activity, premarital, non-marital, pornography, masturbation, all of these treat one's body as a tool for the person's desires. But no, person is distinct from body, so the body becomes a tool for your own desires, rather than treating the body as if it were the person. Thus, it allows you to use yourself or another as a tool. This instrumentalizes persons, which is wrong, and it seeks one good, union maybe, at the violation of others. And so, Premarital, non-marital sex, including masturbation, as is the use of pornography, is always illicit. I won't go into the various social consequences of these acts, which are considerable. Pornography is a huge deal in our society. Pornography is so prevalent uh, that it's actually changing sexual proclivities and sexual tastes. What people consider to be normal sexual acts, which are just sort of plain sex, are drastically different now than they were 50 years ago because of what pornography teaches, especially about women and their own desires. There's some unhappy stuff I can have you read if you want. Some of you have read it with me, you know how unhappy it is. It's terrible. All right, homosexuality, issue three. We all know how unhappy this discussion often is in Christian circles, and that's a great sadness. If any of you find yourself with desires for the same sex or are friends who do, I am so sorry for how our communities sometimes treat or talk about you. I'm so sorry that often our communities isolate and demonize you or your friends. And I'm so sorry that Christians often follow obvious double standards when it comes to heterosexual and homosexual activity. I'm genuinely sorry about that. That's a real crime and a real shame, and it is the Christian church not being responsible to the gospel. And that someday, there will be those of you who are vindicated by the Lord himself, which is what resurrection is. Now, some of the unkind and deeply confused teaching which emerges from the church, I think, is because of... Um, sorry, let me rephrase. That unkind teaching very often results in another error which is a kind of unthoughtful conception of love, where love is supposed to mean sheer acceptance of acts. Love implies acceptance of persons. It does not always imply acceptance of acts. For love, as defined earlier, entails willing the good for the other. And if the preceding pages are true at all, then it's quite clear that homosexual activity is not good. And so willing it or willing to allow it is not to will the good of oneself or to will the good of another, and so is not thus to will love. It's to will a, a, a simulacra of love, a chimera, a false image of love. Homosexual activity is not to be done. For only the marital embrace allows for comprehensive union that neither uses nor disintegrates personhood. And because the marital embrace by definition entails one flesh union, and one flesh union is defined as sex acts of the reproductive type, which is not possible for homosexual unions, there is no such thing as same-sex marriage. 
and same-sex acts cannot but disintegrate and use the person. They are always thus illicit. There is no such thing as homosexual marriage. Thus, there cannot be licit homosexual activity because only married sexual activity is licit. Now, I know that seems hard and I know that seems cold. I know that. I know that for many of us and for many of our friends, that sounds like condemning others to a life without sexual satisfaction, without marriage, without relief, and even to condemnation and perhaps solitude and isolation. I know that. I know how hard that sounds. But think for a moment about the consistency of the traditional Christian answer, which is what I'm trying to articulate in these lectures. I'm not trying to articulate the contemporary evangelical answer. I'm trying to articulate the traditional concept uh, Christian answer. Think about the traditional answer as opposed to some of the more lenient versions of the status quo compromise. If, in the status quo compromise, one would allow for marriage which begin with the assumption that sex and reproduction are severable with contraception and that one in fact is responsible if and only if you sever fertility from sex, or if you begin with the assumption, as do many contemporary Christian counselors, that solo masturbation is okay, and then still conclude that homosexuality is wrong, you have committed a great unfairness because you have claimed that it's okay for heterosexuals to divorce sex and pre procreation, and for heterosexuals, sex can be merely a tool for A, pleasure, or B, friendship, or C, comfort, or D, fun, or E, whatever, but with an apparently and completely arbitrary and random insistence that that very same pleasure, friendship, comfort, fun, or whatever must be other-sexed rather than same-sexed. But that's completely random and arbitrary. Right? And you know how often that argument goes, right, from the sort of less sophisticated Christian pulpits. It's okay for us heterosexuals to be doing what we disallow homosexuals to be doing because God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's blatantly unfair, that's blatantly thoughtless, and it's blatantly bigoted. So, is there any reason in the, tr in the contemporary compromise to allow for heterosexuals to use their bodies for pleasure, fun, comfort, mutual aid, satisfaction, the minimization of sin, and then to say that it's not okay for homosexuals? At best, the answer seems to be, the Bible says so somewhere. As if the Bible doesn't say things which are true and intelligible and reasonable, but just says stuff. If the Bible says it, it's because it's true. It's not true because it says it. Now, the tradition treats heterosexuals and homosexuals with perfect equality. No sex outside of marriage. No absolute severing of sex and reproduction. Absolute fidelity to one's marriage partner. And these standards are applied to everyone equally so as to honor what it means to be a person. So that persons are not used but embraced. And so that the good is integrated into a whole life. The Christian sexual ethic is about a whole life, health, fullness, joy, gift, the image of God, entering into the perichoretic communion, which is God himself. Now, I understand the difficulty of asking someone who is homosexual to never act in their desires. And since I do not think myself that homosexuality is simply nurture or choice, but is very often linked to genetics, I think it's absurd to think otherwise, I know then that the tradition asks a lot because it asks certain people who find themselves by nature inclined in a certain direction to not act on their desires. And the reason that's not unfair is that the Christian tradition asks the very same from everyone. Absolutely everyone, it asks the very same. And it sympathizes with absolutely everyone as they struggle to be faithful to the Christian sexual ethic, including you all the time. We ask for the same thing from everyone because of the very fact that all humans are persons, all humans are created in the image of God, all persons are equal in dignity and worth, and thus all humans have the very same and identical goods. And so to allow goods for one and not the other or to define the goods differently is in the end to suggest that some people are not equally humans. That's not charity, that's in fact unkindness. The conclusion. In the next lecture I'll talk about discipleship in some concrete terms. The next time it's going to be, so what are you supposed to do? Here you are, you're 20 or whatever. For now, let's just say the following. We all know this is difficult, but the good sought here is very good. It's not only the good of our own persons, but the good of friendship, society, little children, intimate friendship with God, 
The scripture begins with marriage. Christ's ministry begins with marriage and good wine. Secular time ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so your own body and its good use tokens forth the kingdom of God. And it does so as a cross sometimes. Because that's the shape of the Christian life, because it's the shape of Christ's life. You token forth the gospel, sometimes through suffering. I often think that the young, the unmarried young I mean here, have a particular opportunity to cherish and thus to bless marriage. For the married know very, and remember very well the temptations and struggles of youthful passion. Just as the married perhaps now struggle with infidelity or passion, or sometimes struggle with lack of passion, or sometimes with aged impotence, and the chastity and fidelity of the young bear witness to the married as a sign of witness and encouragement, just as the married in their fidelity are to bear witness and encouragement to the young in their own struggles for chastity. But we are all to bear each other's burdens, and we bear each other's burdens in the main by being faithful. We bear each other's burdens in the main by being chaste and faithful. We all know that in the end, the one flesh union of marriage is caught up into the union of Christ with our own natures, which allows for our natures and our humanities to be caught up into the inner life of God and its communion. Your cross then, whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, whether you struggle with pornography or don't, whether you're dating or married, right, whatever your cross is now, it bears witness to the gospel, it bears witness to human flourishing, and it bears witness to the supernatural vocation of our end, which is being caught up into the divine drama of God's inner life, which is endless and ecstatic. And those trials and temptations are surely worth that. They're surely worth an eternal weight of glory for which we all hope and which marriage itself is a sign and foretaste of. And until that day, we wait in eager longing, a longing which is not entirely dissimilar to the longing you feel for physical union and know so very well. That longing itself is a sacrament to allow you to understand the earnest desire you ought to have for God. Even Plato knew that. You've read Symposium. Be faithful then in good confidence of what waits, both in the wedding chamber to come and in the eschaton.